Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for giving me a few moments of your time on this great festival. I think it's a really fascinating point in time for us to have an innovation festival here at some, somewhere like Newcastle, um, considering what's going on, the history of Newcastle, the history of innovation that we're seeing in, in the Australian marketplace, and the way that businesses are struggling with the challenges of innovation these days. Um, and I thought I'd start off um, by going back a little bit in history. I have a friend who's a futurist, and uh, he says that to look forward into time, you need to look twice as far back. So if you want to look 10 years into the future, you need to look 20 years back to see what has, what has changed and what is likely to take place in the next 10 years ahead. Um, and when I looked at uh, the University of Newcastle's fantastic collection of local Newcastle um, photographs and business, um, I found this one, which is actually my father-in-law's family's uh, shop in, in Hunter Street. And uh, what we find is when, when we're confronted with the future, we always look to the past to try and help us gauge where we're going, why we're going there. And this is a great, great example. So if you look at how, you know, how, how a brand's being positioned there, how is the business sitting on the, on the shop, uh, on the street itself? How is it positioning itself in terms of its role in the community? We've got people here, right here in the centre of the, of the shot. I didn't actually see this until I blew it up large. But there's a woman standing there who, who was working in the shop. And there's a young boy over here who's looking longingly at the sweets in the, in the store window. And everyone's saying, OK, how do I get some more of that action? How do I get a piece of that? And what we're doing is we're putting out there our brand, Reliance Confectionery, to say to the world, if you want sweets, if you want a little bit of a different experience, you come into our store because this is the place that kids come to imagine a new world. Um, but in that time, you know, in, in that 1800s, 1900s, the world of advertising was very different. It was pretty direct. It was right in your face. So we've got here Smoke Mazeppa, the smoker's favourite. You know, we don't get that kind of advertising anymore. We have Mason and Marson's Glace Boots are the best. How kind of cool is that? No one says that we're the best anymore. We say, you know, you should, you should want us for other reasons. We're trying to give people lots and lots of reasons to connect with us as brands and as businesses. Um, but back then, we were kind of pretty in your face. And I really found this one fascinating because when you look really closely to understand the media back in 1900s, you really only, ha only had to understand a couple of spaces, Sydney Morning Herald and the Sydney Mail, and that dominated the marketplace. Sound familiar to anyone? Uh, but this guy here, Henry Asser, was selling books on Hunter Street, uh, books and, and, and newspapers. Now, I really think this is fascinating because if you look really close, you'll see that the, the media itself, the most important media vehicle, the, most, the way you get your communications and your messaging out into the, into the public, is through the Sydney Morning Herald. It was one penny, and it was 12 pages long. 12 pages. Kind of cool. Now, the thing about branding and positioning and the four Ps of marketing is that we're doing a lot of work to make ourselves known, to make ourselves reachable, findable, shareable, and all those good things that we find in the digital world these days. But back in the 1900s, we knew who to trust in business because we knew where you lived. And because we had really cool moustaches. Check out these dudes. Um, and that, that, is, that is the thing that, we, that, we, that we're struggling to find these days. How do we find our moustaches again? How do we go deep and say, this is where I sit, this is where I belong, and this is my community and how I live there? Because the thing about local area marketing, I guess, in many ways, is that it is local area. And geolocation marketing, Digital marketing is allowing us to go local again, so allowing us to go one-to-one. -one. So the conversations we heard earlier this morning around Pandora, that whole idea of one-to-one -one listening, not broadcast, but one-to-one, -one, is really part of that journey that we're seeing, which is about moving from a disconnected, socially broadcast um, world into a digitally connected community that is changing the way that we live and the way that we work and the way that we want to work in the future. Um, and we, it's a real struggle for us as businesses because, you know, we, we kind of built our companies like this for a time that was black and white. We had my business in the center. We had my staff who would come and work for me. I had my customers who would come and buy from me. I had some partners that sometimes we'd have to fight a little bit before we could actually get some business done. And we'd have suppliers who'd bring me stuff that I would then sell on, right? That was kind of simple. 
really easy to live with. Um, and we built our marketing in this way, which was to broadcast, to say, okay, hello everyone out there. I've got the best shoes. Come and buy my shoes. I have the smoker's favorite. Come and buy my cigarettes. That's what our conversations were like. But those are not conversations. They're broadcasts. That's just yelling out to someone else out there. Really, and I don't care who you are. I just want to yell. Um, and it was a convenient truth because those shopkeepers, those black and white dudes with the big mustaches and the big names on the top of the shops, they knew something really important, and that is they knew their customers. They knew them really well. But as things evolved and as time changed and as media fragmented, we had to evolve as well as businesses and marketers. And we had to stick with this as a convenient truth. We had to say, okay, if this is the way of our world, then we need these things. We need to be able to broadcast. We need to be able to reach out. We need to do these things. But wait, before I go on further, I just want to ask quickly, put your hands up if you actually studied for the job that you're in now. Oh, there's a couple. Great. And I think it's really interesting, following on from that conversation we just had around education, a lot of us find that the, the roles that we, we inhabit now, the lives that we live now, are drastically different from the ones we imagined ourselves living. We'll come back to this in a, in a little while, if I can get this to work. So, during the course of the 20th century, we became customer-centric, customer-focused. We became customer companies. Kind of sounds a bit harsh and a bit, you know, needy, don't you think? Um, but that's the, well, that was the path that we trod. Um, however, our organizations remained the way they'd remained for about 100 and 150 years. They still remained very hierarchical. They remained the president at the top and the workers down the bottom. We were still thinking analog, but we were living digital. And the 20th century and the 21st century has really brought this into sharp relief. We have these analog skills, but we live in digital lives. We have analog companies, but we live in digital lives. And we have analog processes that, we, that we're trying to struggle with, that we battle with every single day to live our digital lives. And that digital world doesn't look, feel, or operate in the same way. So we're all consumers, we all know this, but yet we go to work and we actually start performing in a quite different way. We start, don't have the, the cool tools that we have on our iPhones in many of our offices. Some places, who has Facebook and social networks that are still available in their office these days? Great. Still a lot of people who have, don't have their hands up though. That's, that's, that's the challenge, is we, we're still working through this whole challenge of what does it mean to be digital? What does it mean to think digital? What does it mean to live digital? But how do we operate in analog? And we have this vision of living in a black and white world when really we're, we're dealing with aliens. And I don't, as, you, as you, you're kind of hearing, you know, um, from younger generations pushing into the workforce now, we're seeing a really different way of thinking, a different way of working, and a different ex a series of expectations. Um, and what these, these people are doing is they're challenging us around what is data? Why is it important? What is privacy? Why is it important? Uh, they're geeks, but they're also really passionate. And the cool thing is that, it, that it's gaining traction. It's kind of okay. People are finding some measure of uh, connection with their communities, with the people that they know and love, people that love to live in a certain place and have interests that are like ours. We can find them anywhere and everywhere. And that's what's kind of cool. But they're very different. It's a very different way of working. So what we need to do is try to find new ways of being able to tap into that and figure it out. So uh, with Constellation Research, we've done some, some looking at big trends and how, trying to understand how they work and where they fit. And we've got five which we call the consumerization of IT. And that is where innovation has stepped outside of the bounds of our organizations. It no longer rests in our houses. Upstairs we have open innovation happening. That's people outside of organizations coming in to innovate on business problems kind of cool, but it's unheard of. It's unheard of in most organizations. And many organizations, many business owners would struggle with that concept, right? But what we're seeing is these five big forces, big data, social, mobile, cloud, and the unified comms, 
are all converging. And they're converging not around the business. They're converging around us, around consumers, around the people who buy stuff from those businesses. This is changing the game for us. And it changes the game for businesses. And it changes the game for consumers. It really puts uh, the consumers back into that, le that leveling of the playing field concept that the, uh, the internet originally came up with. So we went, okay, this is great. I'm a small business. I can now sell anything I want overseas. It was kind of true, kind of not true. But these five forces are really starting to del deliver on that promise. So what we need to do is we need to rethink the marketing funnel. So marketers kind of think in this way. There's lots of stuff happening up the top. We're trying to get you to come down here to conversion. We want you to buy stuff from us. So we're going to step, step you through a process where we're going to reach out to you, make you aware of all the cool stuff we've got. You know, I've got the best shoes that so come by from me. Um, then I'm going to try and get you to think about it and validate what I've got and then maybe stimulate some desire that's going to say you've got, you actually do have the best stuff because you've got these great celebrities endorsing your product. So therefore I want to be like those celebrities, I'm going to buy those shoes. Fantastic, that's called conversion. But as we say, um, digital has disrupted this. So the way that we find and the way that we buy, more importantly, has changed fundamentally. The trick is trying to figure out how can we balance this. Um, so I tried to figure out exactly how we might go about buying something. And if we look at a simple customer journey, these are the different touch points. So there might be a device touch point. There might be a space touch point. So the space might be, I'm at home, I'm going to log onto the internet, I'm going to do a search, which is an engagement piece. I'm going to search the internet, for, which is a channel, and I'm going to look in terms of a target offering that I'm trying to buy. So I'm trying to buy a pair of shoes. How am I going to do that? So you can see that over time, and this might be one evening, it might be a couple of days, it could be weeks, depending on whether you're buying a consumer packaged good or whether you're buying a car. Uh, but it's really going to follow something like this. But the larger the investment that you're going to make, the larger the purchase, the more complicated this is going to be and there's going to be more iterations of it. That kind of looks pretty messy to me. And yet all we're really talking about in a lot of cases with advertising and with marketing is that last point at which we convert, this bit over here where the ka happens. So the challenge for marketers and businesses is how do we be in all these places? How do we find a way of being on TV, being on search, reaching into people's homes, getting a recommendation, having a call center, all these things. How do we do these things? It's really kind of complicated. But that's where digital is, is, is really stepping in because it's also transforming the way that our customers buy. If we look at this idea of the connected consumer, so hands up who does a search for products they want to buy online before they go into a shop. <laughs> I love you all. Uh, so you know, so I, I, I do this all the time. So I'm often standing in, um, in say, uh, office works and I want to buy a printer. And I, I reach out to, I look out and there's five or six different printers. They all kind of do the same thing and they all look kind of the same. There's not really the differentiation except for one's made by Hewlett Packard, one's made by Brother, one's made by Dell. Which one do I choose? I can't tell, they're all the same price. Which one should I choose? So I pull out my phone and I tweet out, hey Lazy Web, I need advice on a printer. These are the three I'm looking at. Which one do you think? And I wait a few minutes, I wander around the store for a bit, and then I come back and I look at my, my um, tweet stream, and I'm looking not for everyone's opinion, I'm looking for the opinions of people I trust. So there's a guy called Nirav, you might follow him on Twitter, he's at Nirav, and he does these technology reviews, he really knows his stuff. And so I wait for what Nirav is going to send back to me, and luckily he does. He says, get the brother, because it's awesome. So I go, great, and I pick it up off the shelf, and I walk over and I buy it. And that's how I'm making my decision. But what I'm doing is I'm discovering, I'm debating, and I'm deciding what I'm going to buy before I go into a shop. Now, all of your customers are doing the same thing. Those three Ds are really important. So that means that your marketing funnel doesn't start up here at discovery anymore. It's, what's, it's what the Pandora people were talking about. How do you discover new music? How do you debate whether that's going to be the kind of music you want? They're taking some of those choices and that, that mess out of the equation for you using big data. That's where that fits in. The same thing happens in your marketing. How do you help your customers discover, debate, and decide that you should be the right choice before they even know that they're looking? Big challenge, right? But that also means that here, 
is where your marketing funnel starts. It starts much, much later. And we found with research that a lot of customers are buying, are, are, are choosing to reach out to brands and customers at that point. So people are, I think it's 78% or so of people are, are choosing uh, to only engage with brands once they're at this point here, which is way, way down the path. That presents lots and lots of challenges for us, but also lots of opportunities. So we have six principles that we need to address to try and understand how this might work. So this fragmentation that we have within our businesses, especially larger businesses, is that there are, there's more mess. There's silos that creates division rather than synergies. So you might have someone who handles your marketing. You might have someone who handles your sales. You might have someone who handles customer service. They're all kind of different and they're all separate and they all have different KPIs, which makes it really difficult. And then the marketing funnel is not working for you before, as, as it has before either. So you need to think about how you stoke that. How do you generate demand at the top end? This next gen customer experience. So what is the experience your customer is going to have when they start to interact with your brand? It needs to come from the outside in rather than the inside out. And that, again, changes the way that you deal with your customers. Because if you're thinking outside in, then you're admitting imperfection. You're, you're admitting that you cannot control the message. Um, and then next generation customers make purchases in their own time. So that's what's really interesting. It really challenges this whole idea that we have around campaigns because if we run a campaign between July and September, what happens if someone wants to buy in October? What happens if it's November or December? Does that messaging just get wasted? Does it just disappear into the digital ether? Um, and these purchasing decisions, as I, as I said, are being made before they reach out to you. The important thing here is trust. And I cannot go, go, go much further. <laughs> if I can leave you with one thing, trust is the most important thing. So how do you build trust at the top end of that funnel? How do you build in that discovery phase, in that debating phase, and that decision point? How do you build trust? How do you reach your organ audiences and your customers in a way that's going to really work for them, not just for you? So some interesting facts I thought I'd throw in there. Um, so marketing mix uh, is, is in transition. So we used to just look at traditional marketing and digital was a small, small run. But these days it's transformed. With about 25% of marketing budgets in 2013 will be digital. Um, in a couple of years, it'll reach up to about 30%, 31% or thereabouts. So it's on its way and it's growing. But the most important factor in this is that it's not just digital. Within digital, there's lots and lots of little silos, as you know. And one of those silos is, mar is, is mobile. Mobile digital is going to accelerate over the next couple of years to such, an, to such a point where it will be 50% of the digital spend in its own right. And that's only going to accelerate. That's going to cause us a whole range of challenges because when we're thinking one penny, 12 pages, that's kind of knowable, right? It's about, does anyone, do people remember these, the 1.44 meg floppy disks? Ah, I can see a couple of people nodding, fantastic. So that's what, it would, what, a, what a, a, a Sydney Morning Herald in 1908 would have fit, fit on, a 1.44 meg disk. These days, it's much more complicated. So um, the information that we have in our libraries is, is, is huge, right? Um, not just in Sydney Morning Herald's, um, but in academic journals, an acad uh, a library floor of academic journals is about 100 gig. Not a, a great deal of information there, considering what we have at, our, at home, we have a, you know, terabyte hard, hard drives these days. But as we look at the vast store of information that's out there, and it's is growing um, every single week, every single day, every single hour, because everything, every time we take a photograph, every time we tweet something, every time we do a Facebook update, every time we publish something on the web, it's going to head in this direction. It just starts to grow and grow and grow. So in 2005, it was a really, really small amount of digital information out there. By 2013, we're up to about four zettabytes. Zettabytes are really huge numbers, and there's probably data people here who know more about that big number than I do, but it's more than a, a 747 filled full of terabyte hard disks. That's how big it is. It's enormous. Um, the most amazing thing about this, though, is not the, the overwhelming nature of the data itself, but the fact that we are at the center of these things. This is my personal 
um, LinkedIn map of my network. And I have about 2,000 connections. That's me in the middle there. And then there's all these companies that I'm connected with. There's all these people that are those dots. But there's also practices, capabilities, expertise levels. That, they're the different colors. And what they are doing is they're all feeding into each other as well. So our, we are the sum of our networks these days. We're not just beholden to companies and organizations. Be sure to check this out as well. LinkedIn Labs, it's really cool. You can do it yourself. Because what we know is that people do business with people that they like. And that's always been the case, and it will always continue to be the case. It's just that our networks have grown, and we need to find new ways of connecting into those things. And I like to think about it as a disruption of some kind. Um, but disruption is kind of the wrong word, because it's disrupting what? It's dis disrupting the business models that we've stuck with for 100, 150 years. So it's old school. It's disrupting the way that we used to work. And the disruption really isn't happening anymore. It's actually, we need to adapt, as you guys say, adapt or die. It's adapting to the new world. And this new world means we have to put our customers, our consumers, at the center of the experience. And that's the consumer verse. It means we have to rethink the way that we do our business and the way that we structure our business. Um, and as Angela Clark pointed out yesterday, the business models that we used to love and, and, and really adhere to and think this is going to last us forever, don't last forever anymore. They last three years. So we need to figure out ways of working in three-year cycles. Some organizations do this really well. Remember Nokia and Symbian operating system? Anyone got a Nokia phone? No one. Microsoft will be crying. But what happened was in, within years of, being, of the iPhone being introduced, the Symbian operating system, which was ahead of its time, um, and the Nokia phones, which were technologically way ahead as well, just dropped by the wayside. And then along came Android, and, and, and Google, and, and Google's, again, revolutionized things. Um, but what, what these companies learned by being these early adopters, and I think there was someone talking about the early adoption curve yesterday, um, by being early adopters, you learn lots of lessons and you're able to apply them really quickly because you're working in shorter, shorter cycles. And as you do that, you're able to reinvigorate your innovation process and your understanding of the marketplace and the way that you operate. And that gives you a leading edge. It means that you're able to operate at the speed of disruption. So disruption becomes business as usual for you. So what we're seeing is that these early digital, digital adopters and these early leaders like Apple, and a lot of the tech companies do this, they use their, their dominance in one market to lead into other markets. So Apple might start with the phone, but they move into music. They might then move from music into film, they might, and so on. And that continues a cycle that allows them to find new markets, create new markets, and keep ahead of their competition. And they're going to do this. This pattern will, will continue over time. Because what they're doing is they're creatively destroying the, the, the businesses that they used to be in, in order to found new businesses to find new markets and to put their customers at the center of an experience that they can only get by engaging with those brands and those businesses. And this is the pattern of disruption as usual. So we need to find ways of embracing that. We need to stop thinking about failure and success in simple ways, and we need to think about innovation and business success based on disruption. <laughs> so uh, quickly, three rules for relevance. Participate with purpose. So it's time for us to really think about what it is that we do. It's not about just participating and sharing content and putting stuff out there. It's really about engaging in a deeper level. We need to move beyond content, content to the realm of service. We need to understand what makes our customers think. And we need to fulfill a role or purpose that aligns with the needs and aspirations of our customers that are connected online. Because the really cool thing about this is that purpose attracts. It creates a center of gravity that brings people into you at the realm of your business. Ah, we need to be connected and connectable. So if you are not online, how relevant can you be? Um, that's just one part. But it's not just being there to claim a space. It's being there to claim a space with a purpose. So people don't really care about whether you've got a mobile strategy or a website or any of those things. They don't, they don't care whether you're on Facebook or Twitter. What they care about is access and availability. They're interested in what you've got to do to help them any channel, any time, in a consumable form. And if you are not connected and connectable, then you're not relevant to the way that they live their lives. 
And this is that customer journey. Coming back to that customer journey, tapping into that and understanding how that works is really vital. So campaigns are dead. Um, by that I mean that the timeframes in which you want to operate your campaigns don't necessarily apply to your customers. They're not really that interested in your campaigns either. Because you're, you're working with a campaign which is time boxed and work from an inside out point of view. You really need to understand the digital journey that your customers are facing, how you can tap into that lifestyle that helps them, and then strategically, strategically plan your communications that help them make decisions at vital points in their customer journey. So if you've got someone who's interested in your stuff, it doesn't matter whether it's in campaign or out of campaign, help them understand what the value proposition is. And by doing that, you'll have that customer for a longer period of time. So I'll tell you quickly that the, the question I asked earlier around the, um, the, the job that you're in and whether the education, whether you studied for it, was, a, was, a, was an interesting challenge. Because when I asked a lot of people on Twitter, I got a, a couple of thousand responses and I was fascinated to see how big that, that, that went really quickly. And I, I think 50% of people said they did not have that, uh, they did not study for that job. Um, about an, an additional 18% or so said that they, um, they never knew that the job existed in the first place. And then a, I think a further 5 or 10% actually fell into the role that they're in um, without plan. So in a large percentage of cases, so about 75%, we're finding that the education that we, that we get and that we receive um, doesn't prepare us for the future that we're going to live. And that is partly the role that I see organisations having to play. We need to help people build into those things. Because if we can't see the future of our organisations through the people that, that staff them and people that bring them to life, then how are we going to remain relevant to our organisations, to our customers, to our partners, and to our ecosystem, uh, which is the way that we, that we fundamentally will build our businesses over time. So the only solution we have is to embrace disrupt, disruption as usual. It's easier said than done, but I think we're able to, we will be able to do it, and one day we might even get this to work. I think uh, the cool thing about this, and the cool thing about this festival, is that Newcastle is doing that in its own way. It's reinventing itself again in a way that is really transforming the way that people live and, uh, and feel comfortable in their communities and their locations. So I think uh, as a first, uh, first inaugural, inaugural dig, this is a fantastic starting point, but I'm really interested to see where it goes from here. Thanks.